hidden in you I want desire to you alone I holy only you are worthy God let your fire fall down sing it again to you our hearts are open nothing here is hidden God, we pray that you are welcome in this place. We are here and there and scattered all over the community and country to welcome you into our place. God, this is Easter. We come to worship you, to proclaim your resurrection. God, fill this space, your presence, our hearts with your love our lives with your purpose. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Chris Stallings. It's my privilege to get to be an associate pastor here at Hartsville First United Methodist Church and to lead our refresh worship gathering. It's Easter Sunday, and he is risen. He is risen indeed. We should have practiced that, I think, right? So today we're going to get those thrown out there like once or 12 times. And so if you hear that, he is risen. Or he is risen. risen Oh my goodness, y'all. All All right, y'all are going to have to help at home because we're just halfway getting it here. So if you're at home, when you hear me say he is risen, you stand up on your couch, I mean from your couch or on your couch, and you say he is risen indeed because this is Easter Sunday. Let's try it one more time. He is risen. He is risen. Hey, we're getting it now. Are y'all getting it at home? Let's celebrate today in the midst of the circumstances we are in, where we're separated, we're at home, we're isolated. But we are here to proclaim that Jesus is risen indeed. And so I hope you'll be a part of that as we worship. We're going to sing three or four more songs. I hope you'll stand up in your living room or bedroom or wherever you're at and, and get on your feet and praise God. Turn up the TV or the computer or your phone that you're watching this on and sing along and sing loud and hear God's worship proclaim. I hope you'll connect with us. One of the ways we like to do that is to invite you to take out your phone, text in right now, and text the word here to let us know that you're connecting. You can also do that same thing on the uh, Facebook stream in the comments. Just let us know you're here and you're watching. If you text in, it'll send you a link. If you haven't connected before that you can use to Share your contact information, your name, uh, email, and confirm your text number. And we'll use that from time to time to send you information that's relevant to what's going on in the life of the church. We also love to worship through giving. You can give online. You can text the word GIVE to our text number 513-7200. It'll send you a link that you can use to give now or anytime securely online. I hope you'll worship with us as we proclaim, He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, y'all saying it? All right, let's sing some more. Let's go. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show. Love to those around me. 
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever sing We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
Hey guys, we're going to transition now into a time of sermon and preaching. If you want to take about a minute to freshen your coffee or grab a donut or go to the bathroom, we'll be back on stage in about one minute for our sermon. We'll see you back in just a second. All right. Good morning again. Unpause it. Wait, you would have had to let it run. Welcome back. We're glad to see you again. Again, my name is Chris Stallings, and I get to be associate pastor here at Hartsville First Methodist and lead our Refresh Worship Gathering. I just want to shout out to those that are working behind the scenes and on the stage with some social distancing between us to still lead worship, um, the sound and, and video guys, the folks that made... Cinnamon buns for Easter. That's a new tradition. You know who you are. You have to do that now from my on. No. Thank you all for being a part of it. The worship team's enjoying that right now. All right. He's risen. Did y'all say it online? He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. This is Easter Sunday. It's the culmination of the series we concluded last week where we were listening to Jesus as he journeyed towards Jerusalem, listen to his teaching, listen to what he had predicted would happen. And this weekend, Easter is when it all came to fruition. Good Friday to Easter Sunday, and we celebrate that here today where Jesus exceeded all our ex expectations in his resurrection. Have you ever had expectations that went unmet? 
Like you had a high expectation for something, but in the end, it didn't turn out the way you hoped it did, but it actually turned out better. And I don't just mean like you're a glass half full kind of person, like, well, it was good, but you know, it's, it's good. You're seeing the good on it. No, it actually was much, much better than you had ever even hoped. I remember a couple of times, a few times in my life where that's happened. One of the ones was whenever I started college. I first graduated high school in the early 90s and went to the University of Alabama Huntsville, UAH, and started just gangbusters, was going all in. And after about two days, I learned that the school there at the time was more of a commuting school. There weren't that many people that lived on campus or stayed in the evenings, or especially on the weekends, so there wasn't much of a community around that. And so after a few weeks, I kind of was like just all schoolwork and no fun, no community around that. And so I started missing home, missing friends. And so I started driving home on the weekends to hang out with friends from high school. And that turned into almost every weekend and then occasionally some evenings during the middle of the week. And my time spent in class and studying kind of diminished. And my grades started diminishing as well. And it was kind of a a miserable or meek existence. And after a couple of quarters of doing that, I realized something had to change or I wasn't going to finish what I'd hoped to start, which was graduating with a degree. Well, I started looking around, what could I do differently? And I'd always thought about going to Auburn. And some of you will love that. Some of you may not love that as much, but bear with me. Where I could have qualified to go there right out of high school, after a few quarters of not too good of grades, I didn't qualify to enter into the College of Engineering. And so I started talking with the admissions team there and said, well, how can I do this? How can I transfer? And they said, well, we can put you into a kind of general college, not the engineering school. If you'll do right, if you'll bring your grades up, you will be able to apply for and maybe next year get into the College of Engineering. And so I did. I transferred after my first year to Auburn. And I did. I I put myself into dedicating my work. I created some space between me and those people that were not that good of the influence, that didn't go to college back home, that were oftentimes saying, you should just quit school and come work with us. We can have a lot of fun. I don't know if y'all ever had somebody like that in your life. So I created some space. And after a couple of quarters, I'd raised my GPA up enough to get into the College of Engineering. And it worked. I sustained through that long journey and and graduated with a degree in engineering from Auburn. And it turned out that was better than what I'd even dreamed of when I started out going to college. And yes, if you're wondering why I'm here with an engineering degree, I have since gotten a a master's of divinity from a seminary. And that's a whole other story that began when my company I was working for in 2004 decided to move the office to Asia, and I had to decide if I was going to move there with it or look for another job. I had invested so much of my time and energy, and I was so disappointed. And God used that time to transform my life for eternity, where me and my wife took a cross country camping trip. And on that trip, I read a book called The Purpose Driven Life, where I realized the good news of Jesus. And I put my faith in him. I was saved on that trip, all because of something I thought was awful. It didn't meet my expectations. turned in to be a life-changing event for me. And then there was that time in 2020 when the whole world was on lockdown for coronavirus, where expectations changed. And it turned out, we're not sure. Many of us are feeling that loss of expectations, the letdown, 29 days into social distancing. And recent stay-at-home orders where we're limited to what we can do. I checked the stats last night, and globally over 1.8 million people have been confirmed to have the virus. In the United States alone, 500,000 People, on Friday alone, over 2,000 people in the United States died from coronavirus complications. 
If you look at the total number of deaths in the average day, that's 26% of people died from that virus alone. Lost jobs, lost health, lost retirement funds, lost school, lost sports, lost graduation. Even on Easter Sunday, the loss of getting to meet together with our church. Although we're not quite sure, we we think we're going to come back. Although we're not sure what the new normal may look like on the other side. And in the process of this, many of us have evaluated what is our expectations of life. What do we value the most? What do we put our money into? What do we put our time into? And maybe it's given us a chance to take a different look. If everything is flipped upside down, what is your one most important thing? And so today we're going to look to a passage in the book of Luke. If you've got a Bible, you can start turning there. Luke chapter 24. You can also text the keyword Bible to our text number 513-7200. We're going to look at the unmet expectations of the followers of Jesus. These folks were folks that finally had someone in Jesus that opened up God's kingdom to them. Like before Jesus came out and explicitly said God's kingdom is for all these people, there was kind of a perception that it was limited or only a few people qualified, those who had enough money, those who had the religious power, or maybe those who just had the most might. You may have heard the saying that might makes right and power and money or establishment. But Jesus proclaimed God's kingdom was for everyone, and he invited those people, people who might not have had much might, maybe even had a life of blight, of disease, affliction, of poverty, of shame. And Jesus met those needs with his presence, with his acceptance, with his healings, and with his words that said simply, follow me. And they did. People followed Jesus from the countryside, from near and far, and they followed him, and they began to put more and more of their life into him. Ultimately, as we celebrated Palm Sunday last week, they proclaimed him their king as he went in to Jerusalem. But, it didn't, but then it came to a crashing halt. Overnight, their expectation of having their king in power came crashing down. Judas, who was one of Jesus' closest followers, betrayed him for a few pieces of silver. The Pharisees, the temple guards, the high priests, who had been trusted with religious leadership, arrested and put Jesus on trial. Pilate, the ruler who said, I find nothing wrong with this guy, whenever the people shouted loud enough, said, I condemn him to death. Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who had no guilt, was tortured, nailed to a cross, and left to hang there until he died. Now, this was all fulfilling what God had put in place to bring salvation to everyone who would ultimately believe in Jesus. But in that moment, the people who followed Jesus closely thought they were in serious trouble. Their expectations for a king, their whole world, their whole hope had come crashing down on that Friday when Jesus died On the cross. So it's in that interim between Friday and what comes next that we pick up the story. Luke chapter 24, begin reading in verse 1. I'm reading the New Living Translation if you want to follow along. Luke 24, verse 1. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. 
So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. Verse 5, the women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember, remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Verse 8, then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe. However, Peter jumped up and he ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again wondering what had happened. The New Interpreter's Bible Commentary says that the core of this announcement in Luke is the declaration that he is not here, but he is risen. There's a verb that's used there to rise, and it's got a passive sense to it that he has been raised, declaring and confirming it was an act of God that did this to Jesus. Don't miss this. This is the defining act of God in all of history. It's what transformed mankind from condemnation to hell to the opportunity to receive salvation, to be reconciled to God. Without reconciliation, we stood condemned. Without resurrection, we stood without hope. But with resurrection, we are hope-filled Easter people, filled with the greatest recovery, greatest bailout, greatest paycheck that we didn't deserve, and so much more that we didn't even know how to ask for. Luke validates this act, this resurrection of Jesus by God, referring to the prophecy that Jesus had made himself that said, these three things will happen, I'll be turned over to the others. I'll be crucified, and on the third day will rise again. These predictions by Jesus as the Messiah validated and echoed other predictions from the Old Testament prophecy that we know because it happened to be true. There was a Jewish tradition at the time that it was a simple test if someone was a prophet of God. Like people would prophesy and they'd say, okay, this is a word of God. And, and God said, here's how you'll know. Test them. If what they say happens, they're of me. If it doesn't, they're not. There's a passage from Deuteronomy that says, if the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. The prophet is spoken without the authority and need not be feared. But if it happens... It's of God, and what happened to Jesus was what he predicted would happen. The prophecies all came true. Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, God's anointed one, not a false prophet that was dead and left to disappear. No, he had been raised from the dead. Christianity equals resurrection. Other religions may offer good morals. Other wise men may offer knowledge on how to get by or to succeed. But only Christianity offers resurrection, prophesied and delivered, never repeated since then. God raised him. He is risen. He is risen indeed. A theologian, Wolfhart Pannenberg, proposes that the resurrection is the key for interpreting all of Scripture. 
With it, we have what we need to interpret Scripture. Without it, it's worthless. Since the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was the For the early Christian church, the decisive point in the history of his relation to God, to Christianity, the resurrection is the key to interpreting all of Scripture. Jesus is confirmed to be one with God, the agent of reconciliation between God and humanity. Did y'all grow up with the secret decoder rings, like in cereal boxes? I guess at times there was like a, a spy that would use that in real life, not a cereal box version, to interpret or to be able to decode a secret message that they had obtained. Resurrection is the decoder for understanding God and Scripture. Resurrection, for you video gamers, is the ultimate cheat code to get you to every next level you've always wanted to go to. Resurrection to interpreting Scripture It's like the 75% off coupon code that's good also on the day after Thanksgiving to you holiday shoppers. Resurrection is the key to interpreting Jesus. Luke and the other gospels affirm that the grave was empty. In other letters, New Testament authors confirmed what had happened was he was risen He was risen indeed. Even those who followed Jesus when they faced persecution, faced threats, it says, renounce Jesus. Don't say he rose from the dead. Don't use his name and the power associated with it. When those people were faced with even death, they said, I can't deny what I've seen. He was raised from the dead. And so it's from that basis he is risen, our whole faith begins, continues into fulfillment with God. So let's look at what he is risen meant to this first disciples that follow Jesus, to us, to you, to me here today, and to our church here and now. The first thing, he is risen in your doubt, in your distress. Luke 24, verse 3 and 4, the first part say, So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, they were puzzled. They didn't find the body. They were puzzled. If you've experienced doubt in your faith, or you're wondering what this is, or you're saying, Pastor, I'm a scientific kind of person. I don't know how to take this theory of Jesus' resurrection and test it or experiment with it to prove it beyond a doubt. Just know that you're not alone. The first people who showed up in that empty tomb were puzzled, faced doubts. They had distress because of what they had gone through. In fact, this whole weekend of Easter that we celebrate now was their most distressful moment in life they had lost everything they'd put so much hope into when Jesus died before they saw he was raised if they had it their way Jesus would have come into Jerusalem with this triumphant entry and gathered a military force and overthrown the Roman occupiers and cleaned up that temple that had been led by misguided religious leaders but none of that happened And what was hundreds or maybe thousands on Palm Sunday welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem turned into a handful, maybe just two or three, that showed up at the tomb that day just to pay their respects, to do some embalming of their friend who had died. But I can't explain how or why God always works this way. But if you look at history and Scripture and in so many of my life and your life stories, when we're at our lowest, when we look like all hope is gone, when we have doubts and distress, God tends to show up and show out in those cases the most. If we look at how God has revealed himself In Scripture, it seems like when our plan A and our plan B and our plan X, Y, and Z are all used up, God shows up and says, this is what I've been doing all along. 
So if you have doubts, if you're in distress, I want you to know this message, this day, the resurrection is for that very case. I want you to know the resurrection of Jesus is for you. It's not an accident that you're here today or watching online that you got out of bed on these dreary quarantine days and that you pass by the Netflix to come and watch church online. I've been praying for you this week, praying that God is working in your life, getting you past those hurdles, getting you to the point where you're facing your doubts, your distress, to the moment like these first followers of Jesus where you can say, I'm here, I don't understand, I'm puzzled, but I'm here to hear from God. It is for this very moment God has been preparing this message, working in and through the service. God is here and risen to meet you in your doubts and your distress. Because God wants to, number two, he's risen for your discovery and faith. Not to leave you in a puzzled or distressed standpoint. Look at verse 5. It says, after the, the men appeared, the women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked them, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive. Go down to verse 8. It says they remembered that Jesus had said he would rise again. God's messengers showed up that first morning. They knew that the first women to discover the empty tomb were already down, had experienced loss. We're looking for something different just to honor and respect Jesus' body. They were expecting something different, and not even that was there. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? They asked. You're looking for something. You've been looking for something in your life. And it's come up short. You've been looking in the wrong places, and it's come up short. The messengers reminded them of what Jesus had said so that they could move past what they were looking for and experience the resurrected Jesus. They remembered that Jesus said, I will rise on the third day. Do you ever get those kind of God wink Moments in your life where a number of circumstances, coincidences, that are too many to be just a stack of coincidence where you say, I know that was God showing himself to me. Where God is saying, I love you. I've got you. I'm going to get through this together with you. The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest God wink of all time. The ultimate God wink, and it lasts not for a moment, but for a lifetime and for eternity. No matter what circumstance you're facing, today on Easter Sunday, God is winking at you saying, I got you. I want you to discover the truth and put your faith in Jesus, will you remember the things Jesus promised? He has risen for your discovery and faith. Number three, he's risen to deploy you for a purpose. Verse 9 says, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell the 11 disciples, and everyone else, what had happened. Once these ladies remembered what Jesus said, it was like their light bulb of faith had gone off. And it was like, I, I, I remember him saying he was going to die and he was going to rise from the dead. I just thought it was like one of those stories he used to tell. And, and I didn't know what he meant. I came here this morning and he was gone. I didn't know what to expect. But now I get it. The purpose for which God sent Jesus 
has been fulfilled and I've got to tell someone. They realized that the resurrection was for them, but was for more than just them. They rushed to tell the others. If you've got it, tell it. This current crisis where we cannot gather together in our churches, where we cannot gather for communion, where we can't gather for small groups and serve teams, it feels like it's breaking us from our mission. of being deployed with a purpose. If you look at the resurrection, I see the purpose of God for which he has deployed the church, and I can't imagine that it's God's desire that our purpose would be broken in this time. But maybe we, we have an opportunity to change our expectations. A time where God's Spirit would move in us and through us to tell others in a totally new way the, the truth, the eternal truth of Jesus' resurrection. Maybe God's Spirit is more at work in these times than it has ever been when we've gotten into the mundane, the, the regular, and in this disruption, we would seek God and allow His Holy Spirit to transform us out of disruption into a fulfillment of our purpose. For a couple of weeks into this crisis, I was praying for God, I don't know, or God, I'm sad. And this week, and especially last week, and especially this week, I began to pray, God, envision in us where we come to an empty church Help us to remember your church began in an empty tomb where all expectations felt lost until we realized that he is risen. And I'm praying, God, that, that even more so, I'm praying that you will unleash your fire and your passion in us when we're gathered at, at home or in our car, wherever we're listening to this word proclaim, and that your Holy Spirit would fill each one of us in this church, in all churches and around the world, because I'm convinced that right now there's no greater need in a world that's hurting, that's lonely, that is afraid than to hear the good news of Jesus. So God, I pray today, inspire us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Show us how to illustrate your love in new and creative ways when we can't get within six feet of other people. How do we and to whom do we rush and tell that he is risen? Spirit, we know that he is risen to deploy. To deploy us for a purpose. God, I pray. Show us how. God, I thank you so much for the good news that he is risen. And God, I thank you so much that we can proclaim that today, that he is risen indeed. But God, I pray in this moment for those that are watching or here in the room that we all have a sense that you are inviting us. to faith, to believe that this resurrection is true, that we can receive reconciliation with God when we put our faith in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so, God, I pray right now there are people that are doing that. They're saying, yes, Jesus, I believe. I have doubts, Jesus. Will you help me? discover, put my faith in you. And God, I believe there are people in amongst us that you are using right now your spirit to guide into new and creative ways to share your love, to share your good news. 
God, I don't have a doubt how you used an empty tomb to start the church, that you would use an empty church building to redeploy us on mission. Guys, I want to invite you, wherever you are, to participate in a spiritual survey. I think we got a slide up. We got a slide up? Okay. It's simple. Where are you at in your faith? There's four ways you can respond. You can text your response A, B, C, or D to our text number 513 7200. Text the letter A if you're in doubt or distress and you're not yet a follower of Jesus. If you would just acknowledge that today, I believe God would use that and say, hey, I acknowledge that, but I'm here, I'm listening. Text the letter B if your discovery of faith and you're a follower of Jesus and you're ready to grow in knowing what he wants for you in your life. Text the letter C. If you're deployed with a purpose, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're going all in, I love everyone. If you can hear my voice, take out your phone now and text a response to that. 513-7200. Text the letter A, B, C, or D. D is if you're just not interested. You can say that. But I would love to know where you're at. We may walk together in that, celebrate in that, and put you a part of a church mission that's rushing to tell the others the good news. Would you participate in that? Right now, take out your phone while we're singing the next song. Write down this number, type it in, 513-7200, and text A, B, C, or D. Doubt or distress, discovery of faith, deployed with purpose. Or just let me alone, Pastor. I'm moving on. If you need to add more to that, you can type those into the comments when you reply. If you would now, join us in singing this song. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began ash was redeemed Your name. 
I'm giving y'all a hand. Y'all give Jesus a hand. Y'all, there you go. Hey, I'm so glad that you joined us for Easter Sunday. And while you were singing that song, text messages were coming in. You responded to the survey. I couldn't sleep last night. I'm just excited for what God is doing in the midst of this because of his resurrection of Jesus. And so in an uncertain time, the only surefire way that death is arrested is by faith in Jesus. So don't let this day go by without receiving that invitation to a lifetime and an eternity reconciled with God. Let me pray for us before we go. God, thank you so much for this day and for raising Jesus from the dead. We put our trust in him. We declare him our Savior and our Lord. Guide us as we go from here and as we live as your church. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. Hey, I think we've got one thing. We're going to continue online only through at least April 30th, so make plan to join us again next Sunday at 11 o'clock, same spot on our Facebook page. Until then, we'll see you guys online or from six feet apart. See you soon.